feel in any particular week, and you know it to be Reformed worship, Presbyterian worship, because that furniture is there. A little side story. My wife grew up in the military, and... Um, and they moved, as you might imagine, every two to three years. Houses um, all over the world, uh, housing all over the world, from twice in Germany to California to New York to Virginia to Alabama. And uh, I always like to say I think that's why my mother-in-law keeps every article of clothing, furniture, or thing she's ever owned because when they wake up in the morning in a different part of the world, they can look around the house and say, this is home. It fits off of a, a sociological principle called the McDonaldization of society, where chains appeal to us because we know what we're going to get when we go there, right? Right? You can, you can book a Holiday Inn, and as bad as it might be, you could probably draw the layout before you walk in. And as bad as the stuff they call food is at McDonald's, a quarter pounder with cheese is a quarter pounder with cheese by any other name all the way around the world. And we like it because it becomes the furniture by which we know we're home. And so today, in thousands of Presbyterian churches across this country, they picked up a hymnal that looked exactly like this. And given that a lot of those churches are having kickoff Sundays, I bet a lot of them sang that drinking song to start their worship. I know, tell me you didn't want to grab a big beer stein, root beer stein, and swing it back and forth. Gather us in the meek and the lowly, right? But, it, but when we sing that song, you can be in Atlanta, or you can be in San Francisco, or you can be in Boise, Idaho, and you say, this feels like It's the furniture that tells us that. And so in Reformed worship, in Presbyterian worship, we have an order of worship that goes relatively unchanged from church to church to church and has gone relatively unchanged for over 300 years in this country and 500 years drawn back to when John Calvin said, I'm a lawyer and I wrote it this way, so do it. Amen. <laughs> um, so we, we begin worship, and you will get this in your bulletins, but I don't need you to pull them out, but if you want, that we start our worship with a sense of gathering, right? And so today, we're going to talk about this first movement of worship that we do every week, week after week, the rituals that make us know, ooh, I'm in worship now. From welcome to call to confession and assurance, we are gathered. Let's put a pin in that and think about these two texts we have today. They're both big texts and strong texts, right? They're texts that speak with deep authority from the river of God's truth. The first from the prophet Ezekiel comes to us just after the destruction of the temple in Israel and the beginning of Babylonian exile. Even before the destruction of that temple in 587, the sheep of Israel had begun to become scattered. The kings weren't doing their job. It's hard at times. I think we have to constantly be reminded of this because in our country, we have a strong sense of the separation of church and state. But Israel does not. The church and the state are one. And God has a very strong and very political or very defined socio-political understanding of the ordering of the world, right? They go through that debate 
in the end of Judges when they say they want a king, right? Does God think they want a king? No. Why does God say they don't want a king? Because they have God. That's a nice, deeply theological answer. And because that king is going to send your children off to war for the king's own good. Sooner or later, kings go bad. Now, you need to know a thing about a prophetic testimony, prophetic word, in which Ezekiel speaks, by the way, God's word, not Ezekiel's word. For prophets, shepherds, and kings are the same thing, right? This goes all the way back to David, who we know to have been two things, right? God's anointed as the second king of Israel, but a shepherd boy with his slingshot and his harp out in the wilderness guarding over the sheep. And, and as a sense of typology, the job of a shepherd and the job of a king, according to God, are not different. You are there to protect and nurture, to strengthen and heal the sheep. So Ezekiel looks out and sees sheep scattered all over the place. They are literally in, to use the words of Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death. And they are there because the kings, the leaders, have not done their job. And God says, I will. If you, O oh shepherds, are going to feed yourself on the sheep rather than feed the sheep, then I will come in all my glory and I will seek out the lost sheep of Israel. You remember uh, the, the text we did a couple weeks ago, the Syrophoenician woman. What was Jesus' reason that he didn't want to help the Syrophoenician woman? Stated in the text, Jesus said, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel, right? Now, mind you that we found that a pathetic excuse for his indifference to the Syrophoenician woman, and so did he in the end. But the point is, this thread here, lost sheep in Ezekiel, gives us the thread of God in Christ Jesus coming to seek out those same sheep to find them one at a time and gather them in. To bind their wounds and heal them, to feed them and strengthen them, to make them in what we would call the body of Christ that is the church. For Christians, the inheritor of the covenant people of Israel. Our worship then begins like Ezekiel in saying, we who have been scattered shall be gathered in from east and I guess I should say from north and from south, from east and from west to be here. To be in a world that often demonstrates casual indifference to us. To gather you in before God. Before God's infinite wisdom and might. And God's intimate mercy and forgiveness. We are gathered and like good Presbyterians, we are ordered. Deuteronomy looks out at the people of Israel. They're getting ready to go in the promised land. Uh, I always like to call this, and it has new meaning now, because I've sent my first one to college, that the book of Deuteronomy is Moses' giant speech to his child on the eve of dropping him off at college. I've given you all that I can. Do these things. 
and you shall prosper. Turn away, and you will walk in the ways of death. Those are Moses' terms. I didn't say those to warn. But, you know, I mean, there's a day I might. Um, but Moses is looking out and remembering uh, and fearing that the people are going to lose their way. They'll become scattered, not because the kings won't have done their job, but because they will be chasing after all the bright lights and trying to tick off all the many things on their to-do list, and they will forget the ordering of their relationship with God. That's what happened to the kings, right? They began to think that they were God, not that they served God. And in the ordering of our lives, it isn't easy Everything is beckoning for our attention. Everything is yearning for us to worship there, right? 30,000 of us gathered, at, and I was one of them, at Boise State last night at a football game. We worship before entertainment and sporting industries. We worship uh, the activities that our children do to make sure we get to all of them. None of these are necessarily bad in and of itself. It's that sometimes the ordering of them all starts to get confused in our head. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves cut off from God, from community, from each other. It's an old um, sort of parable, if you will, of a, of a guy who's on a horse and he is madly galloping through the town, knocking over carts, making people jump out of his way, and somebody shouts to him, where are you going? And he shouts back, I don't know, ask the horse. Have you ever felt that way? I was one of those parents that was not going to overprogram my children. That was <laughs> That was my unscripted wife laughing back there. I don't know. Ask the horse. How did we let this happen? And to that, Moses says, remember who it was who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Remember who it was who fed you and gave you drink in the wilderness. Remember who it was who found you in the valley of the shadow of death and would not let you go. And come before that place. Come before your fellow lost ones. And let yourself be embraced by God. By this community. And communities like this. And so we worship. We worship as a gathering from our scatteredness. We worship as a reminder in call of the deeds of the Lord for which we are grateful. That our presence here is a piece of gratitude just as much as it is a seeking. That it is a receiving of healing and strength just as it is a providing of it by our bound together presence. And to make that binding together happen, we come to a point of confession. We speak out as a patient before a doctor, the dis-ease in our hearts and in our lives. And then God says, without fail, 
I forgive you, and I love you. I forgive you, and I love you. I am forgiven, and I am loved. And then equally important, we're invited to turn to our neighbors and embrace. I think Jess will be okay with this. And say, I love you too. God's peace be with you. And even though I can't stand Brandon, <laughs> I'll embrace him too. And say, God's peace be with you. And so often, because you've worshipped in a Presbyterian church, so often we believe the rules to this part of our worship is that we stand up and we say to the person who we came with, peace be with you. <laughs> we wave to that person because they're kind of far away. We sit back down. But that's not theologically what we're doing as lost sheep. It is literally to cross the aisle. It is literally to go find the person that you argued with last week. It is literally to put to bed and wash away the grievances that prevent us from being the body of Christ. Now, Spoiler alert, they're going to happen again. So we'll do it again. But the, but the idea of our worship is that we have to be gathered, we have to be healed, and we have to be bound together. And then, and only then, are we ready to hear God's word. We are sheep and shepherds. We are recipients and givers. We come before the ongoing generosity of the Lord our God, and we do likewise. This is the word of the Lord.